Welcome back. It sounds like something straight out of Margaret Atwood's novel, A Handmaid's Tale. The forced sterilization of women. Grayson Ajkate investigates horrifying allegations from Indigenous women who say they were sterilized against their will at Canadian hospitals as recently as 2018. For Malika Pop's son, birthdays are all about cake and presents. But for his mom, it's a painful reminder of what happened the day he was born. It is bittersweet. It's very bittersweet. I'm grateful that he's, he's healthy and uh, he's thriving. But Malika is still traumatized by what her doctor did to her at the Royal University Hospital in Saskatoon. During one of the most vulnerable moments in her life, completely alone and afraid, she says she was sterilized against her will. Can you take me back to when your son was first born and you had to go to the hospital? When I went into labor, I was, I was really crying and literally you kind, of, you kind of lose your mind, you know, with the pain and the panic and the urgency. The, uh, there was a nurse that came. She had seen me crying. And uh, she came up to me and rubbed my back. And literally, you know, she said that there's options available if I didn't want to find myself in this position again. That position? Malika's partner had abused her and abandoned her during the early stages of pregnancy. Her nurse said she knew a way Malika wouldn't have to worry about getting pregnant again. And she assured me that no, there wasn't any side effects, that it could be reversed and I trusted her, I believed her at face value. Malika had little time to spare. She had gone into labor almost six weeks early. Her doctor said she needed a C-section to save her baby. But then Malika says she added tubal ligation to her consent form. While being rushed to the OR alone and terrified, Malika panicked and signed the form. It didn't really feel at the time I, I had the option of, of saying no, like these, these doctors are there to help me, I believed that at the time. And I believe I was in survival mode. Malika was sterilized immediately after having her baby. She has an older daughter, Brooke, and now a son, Hayden. She says she had no idea he would be the last child she could ever have. Despite the trauma of what happened that day, Malika was determined to give her children a good life. She went back to school and eventually opened her own daycare. With life back on track, she went to the doctor to have her tubal ligation reversed. I was in a relationship and I wanted to, to have more children. We talked about having more children together and talked about getting married. And when I went and got you know tested and examined and find out that I, I couldn't, um, there was no point for me to continue in that relationship. I didn't want to waste his time because he wanted kids. Malika's fallopian tubes had been cut and cauterized. Even though Malika says her doctor said it was reversible, it wasn't. Devastated by her infertility, Malika sunk into a deep depression. To be almost gutted, that's what it feels like to have your insides taken out and just completely gutted. And uh, it was very, it was very hard for me to, to overcome that. Every aspect of her life was affected, including her daycare. I would see a, a baby and, you know, a pregnant woman and just that ache and that longing would impact me. And it was just like a, hitting a brick wall you know, I didn't want to work with other people and their kids after that. It was very difficult. It was too, um, it was too traumatizing all over again. Malika rebuilt her life for a second time and now works for her home community of Fishing Lake First Nation in Treaty 4 territory, about two hours east of Saskatoon. But something always bothered her about what happened the day her son was born. 
Then in 2015, she saw this headline about Aboriginal women feeling pressured to have tubal ligations. Malika is now one of the lead plaintiffs in a proposed class action lawsuit for the forced sterilization of Indigenous women in Saskatchewan. Her story got national attention when it got picked up by reporter Colin Crozer from the Aboriginal People's Television Network. It crippled me as a woman, reproductively, and um, it took away a huge part of my identity as a woman. Yeah, it forever changed me. She and other Indigenous women say they were sterilized against their will at the Royal University Hospital in Saskatoon. Well, when I first started uh, researching the story, you know, a lot of thoughts kind of go through your head. Um, just how unbelievable uh, it is. Just, just that something like that can happen um, in Canada in the 21st century. But Canada has a long, dark history of sterilizing Indigenous women. Between the late 1920s to the 1970s, eugenics legislation in Alberta and BC targeted them. It's not known exactly how many had tubal ligations, but according to government records, over 3,000 people were deemed mentally unfit and sterilized. The systemic racism got even worse in the 70s. Hospital records show tubal ligations performed on as many as 1,150 Indigenous women, many at federal-run segregated Indian hospitals. And the government knew it was happening. The sterilization of Inuit women was raised in the House of Commons in 1970 by an MP to the Minister of Indian Affairs at the time, Jean Chrétien, later Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I have a question for the Minister of Indian Affairs and Northern Development on a rather serious matter, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to ask the Minister whether he's aware that a program of sterilization of native Eskimo women was apparently introduced and if he is aware of it, will he inform the House who authorized this unnecessary and inhuman program in view of the availability of birth control methods? Chrétien denied knowing anything about the program, but promised to investigate. And yet the sterilization of Indigenous women continued for decades. Malika was sterilized in 2008. But when you read the stories of the women in this report, you will see how we have failed them. After the media storm of Indigenous women coming forward, the Royal University Hospital conducted an internal and external review. They made changes to their tubal ligation policy, and representatives from Saskatoon Health Region that ran the hospital apologized. I am truly sorry, as a senior leader in our healthcare system, commit that I will do all that I can to bring about real change. I mean, there was a few changes made. They said, I'm sorry. And then the story just kind of faded away like they do. You know, in journalism, we're supposed to stay kind of objective and, you know, not necessarily let our, let our emotions get into the story. But when you hear something like that, it's hard, hard not to get upset, right? I'm, I'm upset. For years, Malika was too upset to even look at her health records. But now, during our interview, she confronts the truth of what happened to her. When they said you needed a C-section, they gave you this form. What's it like seeing this form now? For the longest time, I couldn't read it because it was, it was, too, it was too triggering. Now it, it enrages me because I was in my, literally in my most vulnerable, exposed position any woman could be in. And when I found out definitely that this was a violation of my human rights, I was not willing to take that at all. And I knew I would seek justice. Yeah. In 2017, Malika searched for a lawyer. At first, no one would touch a case suing the provincial government. Um, have to suffer the consequences for the rest of our lives, you know, the trauma. Then she got the ear of Indigenous Mi'kmaq lawyer, Elisa Lombard. Why did you agree to take on this case? To be very honest, I don't think that I had a choice. I felt a very strong obligation and responsibility to take it on. I mean, as a woman myself with, with two daughters, uh, 
these are not the kinds of things that can continue to happen. You know, some of the most beautiful experiences in life are, you know, soured and essentially destroyed through this type of mistreatment. Elisa started by launching a class action lawsuit in Saskatchewan, but soon was overwhelmed with calls from Indigenous women in Manitoba. So she filed another lawsuit there in 2019, both seeking $7 million in compensation for each plaintiff. Today, over 100 women have come forward to Elisa, and three more class actions have been started in BC, Alberta, and Quebec by other law firms. What was that like as things were moving forward, everything kind of snowballed? Terribly sad. There was a time that for months on end, you know, I would get calls probably every other day. We heard multiple times that babies were kept uh, from their mothers until they agreed to this procedure. I remember one particular story where there was a, a social worker who was standing at the door and holding the baby and as the mother resisted to the nurse and the physician's request that she um, subject herself to sterilization, um, the social worker would inch closer and closer to the door with the baby. There may be people watching who will say, well, these women deserve to be sterilized because they couldn't properly care for their children. What would you say to those people who have those thoughts? Honestly, I would thank them for exhibiting the very types of prejudices and stereotypes that give rise to the problem to begin with. Coming up. The doctor, he said, all your tide cut and burnt. Nothing will get through that. The fight to stop a grisly practice. There are thousands throughout Canada. When W5 continues. Did you feel like you had a choice? No. No, I had no choice at all. I was literally forced to, to get sterilization when I said no. Since 2017, lawyer Alisa Lombard has been having difficult conversations like these around kitchen tables. And then the doctor, the one that was doing the procedure, he, uh, He said, um, all your tide cut and burnt, nothing will get through that. Listening to women like Sylvia Tuckanell tell the painful and deeply personal story of how she was sterilized against her will. So what made you decide to, to pick up the phone and say, you know, enough? So other women, if they're put in this situation, they, they can see that they can, they can come forward. And they don't have to be scared. With the support of her friend Anne, Sylvia has agreed to put her name forward as one of the lead plaintiffs in Elisa's proposed class action lawsuit in Saskatchewan. Do you have a, a number in terms of how many women you've heard from and, and that this happened to? I'm confident, based on what I've heard and the discussions that I've had, that there are thousands throughout Canada. Thousands of Indigenous women and five proposed class action lawsuits. Another one of Elisa's lead plaintiffs says she was sterilized as recently as 2018. She agreed to speak with us as long as we hid her identity. We'll call her Sarah. Tell me why you want to keep your identity hidden. I don't want to be targeted by doctors. Like, I don't want to be refused health care because of me speaking up about my experiences. In June 2018, Sarah was rushed to the hospital with high blood pressure. Shaking and nauseous from a reaction to medication, doctors said her baby was in distress and she needed a C-section. But that's not all the doctors told her. They told me my body wasn't made for pregnancy and the next pregnancy would kill me and my baby. And they put those thoughts in my head or if I got pregnant again, it would be a death sentence. That's when Sarah says doctors pressured her to get a tubal ligation, telling her it was permanent and irreversible. Then a nurse asked Sarah's boyfriend to leave the room. 
they kind of pulled like pulled me aside and they said, like, you can't just decide that, you know, 10 years from now, if you and your partner don't wait, work out, that you want another kid. I, I felt shamed and I felt like if I didn't agree to it, that I was agreeing that I wanted to have more kids with someone else. Sarah was afraid any delay would jeopardize her baby's life. So she quickly signed the consent form, making a life-altering decision in minutes. I just was signing anything if it meant giving my son a bigger chance of survival. And I told them, like, I don't care if I don't make it, I just want my son to live. Would you say that you were fully aware what you were signing at the not time? Not at all, not at all. I, I wasn't in the right state of mind to make that permanent of a decision. At only 24, Sarah was sterilized. When the procedure was finished, she says she overheard the doctors and nurses laughing. Instead of tying the tubes, they cut and burn the tubes. And they, they joked about how nothing, nothing can get out of them or get into them. And I just, I found that kind of grim, like, that they laughed at the fact that even if I want to get pregnant in the future, it was never gonna happen. But my clients live with this every day. They cannot have children. It was not their choice. They suffer. Do Canadians care? I guess we'll find out. Elisa tried any means necessary to stop the forced sterilization of Indigenous women. Speaking to the Parliament's Standing Committee on Health, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights in Colombia, and the United Nations Committee Against Torture in Geneva, Amnesty International and Planned Parenthood called for the practice to be criminalized in Canada. That those have who have enacted forced sterilization should be held accountable under our criminal code. They have enacted a form of reproductive violence. But despite the public outcry, Alisa says she's still getting calls from Indigenous women saying they were sterilized against their will. And after all the presentations you've done, you're, you're still hearing about forced sterilizations happening. Does any of that discourage you? Very much so. Uh, when I came back from Geneva, uh, after presenting before the UN Committee on Torture, we heard from a woman in Moose Jaw from a hospital bed telling us that this had just happened to her and desperately asking if she can reverse it. And so is it discouraging? Yes, it's absolutely devastating. The majority of women who say they were sterilized against their will live in Saskatchewan. Some say it happened here at the Royal University Hospital. W5 reached out to the doctors named in the class action lawsuit. They declined our request for an interview. So did Saskatchewan's health minister, Paul Merriman. But in a statement to W5, his office said a new tubal ligation consent policy and procedure was made effective as of June 16th, 2021. Does this solve the problem, in your opinion? So, a change of policy is good. It really is. So the question becomes how effective is the policy and what are then the repercussions of not following it? Concrete action is better. With measurable outcomes that result in a safer life. Much remains to be done. But Elisa isn't only suing provincial governments. The Attorney General of Canada is also a defendant. The federal government ran Indian hospitals where many Indigenous women were sterilized. And they still control some aspects of Indigenous health care today. The Attorney General's office also declined W5's request for an interview. But Indigenous Services Canada submitted a statement saying it is working with provinces to increase safety and respect for Indigenous women in Canada's healthcare system, and giving funds to several Indigenous women's organizations, including the Native Women's Association of Canada, National Collaborating Centre for Indigenous Health, and Indigenous Midwives and Doulas, along with pledging $126.7 million over three years. Where did you go with Papa? We go to the store and buy some and what else did you get? But for Elisa, promises from the federal government are of little comfort. 
especially when she's the mom of two girls. The thought that my children, my daughters, could possibly go through this is truly unbearable, absolutely unbearable, and not an option, not an option. OK, I have to jump on one of these logs? Yep. OK. Oh, no. Malika Pop also continues to speak out for her children, Brooke and Hayden. After she had her son, she says she was sterilized against her will and believes it's still happening to other Indigenous women today. I don't want any woman to ever experience this kind of violation, this kind of, uh, you know, this kind of sadness, you know, this failing of not being complete as a woman. I would also hope that my children and anybody else watching this, you know, they use their voice as well and stand strong and united as survivors, as a culture, as a nation. I would hope that our premier, um, our prime minister, um, address these issues and act as leaders should or get the hell out of office. The first step in a class action is certification, which is expected to happen in at least two of the cases later this year.